You know, I realised after a year of uploading, I haven't done Hadrosaur yet. So why not start on a higher and do my personal favourite Hadrosaur, the Parasaurus. Yes, it's a childhood favourite, but this is also the closest you may ever get to hearing a real non-avian dinosaur in life. You need two things to be an icon in the dinosaur world. First, be discovered long enough ago that it was during the very first dinosaur craze of mankind and you're embedded into pop culture over a century. And secondly, have a really unique appearance. Parasaurolophus is one that probably not a lot of non-dinosaur fans could necessarily name, but most people have seen one at some point, recognising that banana head. But I will get into appearance soon enough. This dinosaur was first discovered back in 1920 along the Red Deer River in Alberta and described two years later by William Parks when he named it Parasaurolophus walkeri with a fairly complete holotype showing the skull, most of the body and the upper portions of the legs. The two of the species known from this genus were named in subsequent years by Carl Wyman and John Ostrom as P. Tubison and P. Critocrustatus respectively. The differences between I'll get into soon enough. Now hoping that if one was walking down the street, you'd be able to spot it, but just in case it's hiding behind a newspaper or wearing a hat and sunglasses, here's what the animal looks like. Parasaurolophus isn't fully 100% known, but we do have enough material from this and other hadrosaurs to get a pretty good idea. P. walkeri, the most well-known species, reach lengths of around 9.45 meters or 31 feet and weighed in at around five tons with P. critocrustaceus being ever so slightly smaller and P. tubersen being estimated to be larger, but only the skull is known, so it's not known by how much. Now, like most hadrosaurs, these animals were quadrupedal when standing, walking or grazing, but thought to have used a bipedal gait when they needed to get a shimmy on. The back legs were strong and sturdy, even for a hadrosaur with three-toed feet, and it's likely that the front limbs of Parasaurolophus were typical of hadrosaurs in that they looked more like a sauropod front foot, being a single fleshy quote-unquote finger rather than visible individual digits. Now I'm guessing you've noticed the most obvious feature of this dinosaur, that being the skull. Most of it was actually fairly typical for a hadrosaur, which have been named the duck dinosaurs on account on their snouts resembling that of duck's beaks. Now, just to be clear, this comparison is only superficial. The rostrum of members of this group were stretched out and flattened, forming a beak-like structure that fed into a battery of teeth, with quite possibly the most efficient chewing system in vertebrate history. And don't worry, I will be talking more about that when I come to doing a video on the hadrosaur group. Maybe subscribe so you don't miss it. Then, of course, we have the crest. Haven't you bothered me enough, you big banana head? A large curved crest protruded from what seemed to be the back of Parasaurolophus's head, but this in fact was an extension of its premaxilla and nasal bones. This crest was partially hollow, and it was wondered for some time what this thing was for, from a display structure to a thermoregulation tool to even a snorkel, leading many to think once upon a time that this was a semi-aquatic animal. But this was no simple tube. The inside varied in complexity across species, but they all consisted of winding tubes leading up, around, and back down the crest, resembling that of a trumpet. That comparison was actually an important one too, as it seems now that the likeliest explanation for this is that it was an acoustic structure. Now I'm going to come back to that because I've got a pretty awesome clip to show, but for now let's set the scene by taking a look at this dinosaur's environment. Parasaurolophus has been found in a few formations across North American rocks that are aged between 76.9 to 73.5 million years old. At this point in time, the USA was actually divided into two countries by the Western Interior Seaway, which I talk more about here, with Appalachia to the east and Laramidia to the west. Parasaurolophus fossils have been found on the Laramidian coast of this seaway, showing a low-relief coastal environment with various rivers and floodplains, and vast conifer forests that supported an understory of ferns and various angiosperms, or flowering plants. But these areas became more swampy as the seaway transgressed westward throughout Parasaurolophus's existence. Sharing this environment were various fish, aquatic reptiles like the massive Dinosuchus and turtles, a few small mammals, and, would you believe it, a lot of dinosaurs. Hadrosaurs here include Anasasaurus, Carithosaurus, Brachosaurus, and Lamiosaurus. 
various pachycephalosaurs like Stegosaurus and Spherorothalus, and carnosaurs like Anodontosaurus and Edmontia, as well as ceratopsians like Titanoceratops, Pentaceratops, Utahceratops, Centrosaurus, and Chasmosaurus. When we look at the Ceriscian side of things, we see Ornithomimosaurs such as Guapalon and Ornithomimus, Dromaeosaurs such as Hesperonychus, Latenovenatrix, and Dromaeosaurus, as well as Tyrannosaurs such as Gorgosaurus and Despletosaurus. Now, I know that's a long list of dinosaurs, to the point where one might question how this many species coexisted. But you have to remember that these formations were laid over nearly 4 million years, with many of these species transitioning into others. So, back to the function of their crest. Now, I did touch on this on my dinosaur sound video, which I highly recommend if you want to hear some more potential dinosaur noises. But Parasaurolophus, at the time of this video, it's the closest thing that we will get to hearing a real non-avian dinosaur. This crest was CT scanned and a replica was created through which harmonics were played through, producing a variety of sounds. And we don't know the nuances of how it blew air through this or what other vocal elements were involved. So it's meant to be exact, but what you are about to hear are the sounds produced from this kind of structure. So I recommend that you plug in some headphones, close your eyes, and imagine yourself in Lake Cretaceous, North America, as you hear the call of a Parasaurolophus. And that is eerily beautiful, right? Now, again, there could have been several nuances that made this sound slightly different, but this is the closest that we have so far. But as with any feature on an animal, especially the noise it makes, we have to ask why. Well, this crest on Parasaurolophus was all about communication. The call was this animal made could have communicated issues and potential dangers to the rest of the herd, act as an acoustic lighthouse for the juveniles, and the crest itself could have been highly decorated visually in order to differentiate species or even sexes. So if you could pick one dinosaur, what would be the one that you'd want to hear the sound of? Do you think that we'll ever even get closer to hearing the sound of other dinosaurs? Let me know your thoughts down below. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already, and I'll catch you guys next time.